My name is Blaine Bettinger, and I would like to talk to you about subclustering shared matches. So we all know that shared matching is one of the most powerful tools the company give, gives us. Uh, we can do shared matching at any of the DNA testing companies, 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, Living DNA, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and forming these shared match groups really help us form interesting hypotheses about our common shared ancestry. So people are using these shared match groups to do things like finding the biological family of adoptees and working with uh, even much older genealogical mysteries. Unfortunately, simply forming a shared match list doesn't always lead us to a proper, uh, a possible conclusion or a hypothesis. So what I'm going to show you today is a method I use to actually group my shared matches into smaller focus groups we can use to examine these small clusters. So I'm going to use a real life example here. Um, I've changed some of the names and um, I want to show you how I would use this subclustering technique to form these smaller focus groups, these more manageable focus groups of shared matches. So here we see that Frank and John Weston are first cousins. They share a set of grandparents, a grandfather and a grandmother. Now we are fairly certain this is their only shared ancestry, so that allows us to use this technique. If they, for example, come from an endogamous population, if there's recent pedigree collapse, this process is going to be a lot more complicated because their shared matches are potentially going to be related in multiple different ways, which means that subgrouping them is going to be very, very complicated, if even possible. So when I look at the shared match list between Frank and John Weston at, say, Ancestry DNA, I find that they share about 150 matches in common. And our hypothesis, of course, is that these matches come from either their shared grandfather or their shared grandmother, and there's always the possibility of coming from both lines. Now, these matches will come from ancestors of the grandfather and the grandmother. Now, there are some tested individuals who are descendants of both because they're, say, a child of John or a child of Frank. So we're going to ignore those matches for purposes of this exercise. We're trying to find shared match groups that cluster around an ancestor or an ancestral couple that is uh, an ancestor of the grandfather or an ancestor of the grandmother. So, for example, on line ones, line one or two or three or four and so on. Now, simply clustering all of the shared matches into one group puts all of these clusters together. So you're going to get a group one cluster, or you're going to get a, a just one big cluster that's everyone in groups one, two, three, four, um, and beyond. What we want to do is we want to try to break these clusters, the shared match group, into smaller clusters. So what we want to do is find an individual cluster, say, on line one or a cluster on line three. And here in this particular example, line three is an unknown line. So what we're hoping for is to form these discrete subclusters um, and eliminate the ones on line one and eliminate the line, ones on line two and on line four and then focus on the clusters that might be most likely from the unknown line or line three. So what we're going to find is, hopefully, the single shared match group between Frank and John Weston could possibly subcluster into two or more distinct subgroups, so on any of these ancestral lines or further back. So what I want to show you is a process I use, particularly at Ancestry DNA, to form these subclusters of the shared match group between Frank and John Weston. So for example, this is what I expect to find. I expect to find, say, a subcluster through ancestor number one, uh, or couple number one, or maybe a smaller group through ancestor number one. Now, although I show these as being potentially descendants of these clusters, what I mean is they're related to Frank and John through ancestor number, couple number one, for example, um, meaning there could be much further back in time. The cluster could be and just pass through one and grandfather or, and so on. So we hopefully will form these discrete subclusters. So the steps of the subgrouping process are fairly straightforward. Number one, what we're going to do is we're going to group the entire shared match group between Frank and John Weston into one single shared match group. And then at the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to go through that list and we're going to subcluster these shared matches into subgroups. 
then we're going to see later on, then we're going to work with the subgroups individually rather than trying to work with everyone in the large shared match group. Now, obviously, this process is going to work best when there is a large list of shared matches and when the two individuals are relatively closely related. So if this were shared matching between, say, two fourth cousins, two fifth cousins, this might be a little bit more difficult because they're not going to have potentially such discrete and clear subgroups and they won't have as many shared matches. So number one here, what we're going to do is we're going to group the entire shared match group between Frank and John Weston into a single group at Ancestry DNA. So here what I've done is I've logged in as Frank Bettinger. I navigate to his match, John Weston, who is his first cousin, and I will just simply open up his profile. Now when I open his profile, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at shared matches. Again, I'm just looking to put all of these people into one shared match group. There's about 150 of them, and so I click on the Shared Match tab, and now I see the first couple in the list. So what I'm simply here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add them all to a new group, and I'm going to call it In Common with John Weston, or ICW John Weston. So if we look back here, I'm going to put Karen in it, New, York, new W19081, Philip T, Jennifer Thomas. They are all going into this Shared Match group with John Weston. Okay. So I simply click on Add to Group. Then I will call it something like, as I said, in common with John Weston. I'm going to assign a color. Here, I'll just pick the yellow color. That's the suggested first color there. Or I can change it to any color I want. And then hit Save. Now I have a, a group. I have the in common with John Weston group with the yellow dot. I add Karen and all the rest of the 150 match shared matches between Frank Bettinger and John Weston to that group. All right. So now... I have everyone, all 150 or so matches in this one group, the in common with John Weston group. So everyone in this group should have a little yellow dot next to the add edit groups showing they've been added to this group. It's a little bit tedious, but it shouldn't take more than uh, a couple of minutes to add everyone in this cluster into that group. And I'm always hoping that at some point Ancestry will add the functionality to add everyone in a shared match group to a single group with a single click. But we may see that, we may not. So step one is done. Now step two, we're going to subgroup these 150 matches into new subclusters. So what we expect to find again is that all of these shared matches potentially will form subgroups. Now, as I said before, this will not work for everyone. Hopefully though, you're going to find some discrete subgroup, subgroups within the shared match list that will help you focus on a particular ancestral line, rather than having all of these different lines uh, bunched into one large group. Okay, so we have these. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the shared match page with John Weston. What I recommend is refresh everything, um, make sure that you're working with the full shared match group between Frank Bettinger and John Weston. All right, so we go to the match page, we again click on shared matches, and just like we had before, we have everyone in a single group the yellow in common with John Weston group. What we're going to do here now is we're going to open the match page for person number one, just the first person in the list. You, um, I recommend starting with the first person. Here we're going to start with Karen Greenhill. Just happens to be the first person shared between Frank Bettinger and John Weston. So I'm going to open the match page, and then what I do is I go to shared matches with Karen Greenhill, the first person in the match list. Now, when I open this shared match group, what I notice immediately is that some of the shared matches between Frank Bettinger and Karen Greenhill are in the John Weston group, and some are not. And this is to be expected, because remember, Ancestry has a matching threshold of fourth cousins. So while some of these will show as not being shared with John Weston, they will in fact be shared with John Weston, but fall below that threshold. In addition, just because of random inheritance, some of these may be um, shared on shared genealogical lines with John Weston, but may be not shared because John Weston didn't happen to get any of that DNA. So at this point, we have a decision to make. And I, I think there are two options. So just to blow this up a little, like you see here, um, the second match and the fourth match are shared with John Weston, but the first, third, and the fifth in this group happen to not be shared with John Weston. So we have two options here. 
option number one is to only add shared matches to a new subgroup. So if we look back here, we would only add person number one and person number four to the shared match group, this new subgroup. The second option is to add all of the shared matches between Frank Bettinger and Karen Greenhill to a new subgroup. Personally, I prefer option number two. I think this is a way of an enlarging a shared match subgroup. Now, I may be bringing in some matches potentially that shouldn't be here, so you can decide for yourself. You can try it under number one, you can try number two, then uh, change your mind and, and try it both ways and see what works and wasn't, what doesn't work for you. So let me re 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 reiterate this. What I mean is, so here I can either add person number one, two, three, four, five, all to a new subgroup, or I can only add person number two and person number four because of the O's of the only two shown to be shared with John Weston here. I preferred to add everyone in this shared match group between Frank Bettinger and Karen Greenhill to a new subgroup. What is interesting is that when you click on the All Matches tab at the top of the page here, even in the Shared Match view, um, you can check and see, and it's specific to the view you're looking at. Um, so, for example, in the Shared Match group between Frank Bettinger and Karen Greenhill, there's a total of 62 matches. It's a large subgroup. But only 24 of those are shared in common with John Weston, and you can see that right to the left. 24 in parentheses means that's the number of shared matches between Frank Bettinger and Karen Greenhill that are put into that in common with John Weston tag group. So again, I can either add all 62 matches or I can add 24. I personally will add all 24, all 62 shared matches to the new subgroup. And I'm going to call it in common with John Weston subgroup one. You can use whatever name you want. I'm just going to happen to use uh, this particular name. My next subgroup, of course, will be subgroup number two and so on. Now, I will omit very close family members. So if I've tested other descendants of that grandparent couple I showed you, I wouldn't add them to a group because they're essentially we're going to be in most or all of these subgroups, and, and that just makes things more complicated. Plus, they're not going to add much to the analysis. So I'll just add more distant relatives, anyone beyond a close family member to this, in common with John Weston group, if they show up in this particular subgroup we're working with, this subcluster. Now, don't forget to go and add Karen Greenhill, person number one, to that in common with John Weston subgroup one uh, group as well. Okay, and you can do that right on the top of the shared match page now. So what has happened is we've gone from the appearance on the left now to the appearance on the right, and everyone in this list, all 62 people, are now in the orange subgroup one group. Right? Okay. So... Now what we do is we can see here again, all of these people, one, two, three, four, five, are all in that subgroup. You can decide whether you want to add just the yellow dots or everyone to this particular subcluster. Once we've created this, the new group shows up in the filter tab on the top of each page. So here, for example, the uh, in common with John Weston subgroup number one has 55 members. As I said before, I've omitted close family members, so it's a little bit smaller than everyone in that subgroup. Um, so here I have 55 people in that first subgroup. It's a relatively large subgroup. All right, now we simply go back and go to the shared match list again with John Weston. So we sort of reset this, refresh everything, go back to the shared match list with John Weston, and go to shared match number two. So we open up the shared match page, uh, uh, the profile page for new Y19081. Go to that page. Click on the shared matches, and you can see here's the shared match list, some of it with person number two. Now again, we have some people that are in the yellow dot group, meaning in common with John Weston, and we have some that are not. So you need to make the choice here. Are you going to add everyone? Or are you going to add some? Only the yellow dots? I'm going to add everyone here. What's interesting is we can also see that sometimes people will be in two subgroups, two or more even this potentially might suggest a connection between the subgroups. So here, for example, the second person in this shared match list is already in subgroup number one. I will continue to add them into subgroup number two, even though they're in that first one. And again, these might be clues. It might tell me there are interrelationships between subgroup number one and subgroup number two.
Now it just so happens that I happen to know the connection with this particular group. So when I look at the notes of this shared match group, for example, I see they are most of them or many of them are related through the Johnson family. So instead of calling this a, an unknown new subgroup, I can actually call this the in common with John Weston Johnson subgroup. All right, so now I'm going to put everyone into this new purple group. All of these shared matches that are shared with person number two and Frank Bettinger are now placed into this Johnson subgroup. Some of them I knew went there, some of them I didn't, so it's helping to also expand this particular group and provide new insight into this Johnson family. Now, this subgroup is much, much smaller. It's only uh, seven people. So it is a smaller subgroup, but there you're going to find some of them are bigger, some of them are larger. And here again, I have this connection potentially between subgroup number one and the Johnson subgroup, which might help me with research down the road. Um, it may indicate maybe that there's too much interrelationship for this to be useful, but at this point, we'll continue to subgroup. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue down the list of shared matches with John Weston. Now what I recommend is to refresh the list often. Maybe close your tabs, reopen Ancestry, go back to John Weston, and so on. Because what can happen is you can get sort of stuck in loops, or um, you're not looking at a full list, and so you want to make sure you're refreshing, and you, sh you go back to that original shared match list with John Weston. Now note that at some point, you're going to have a lot of matches in these subgroups, and when you open a new match in the shared matches between um, Frank Bettinger and John Weston, for example, you might find that that person doesn't really form a new subgroup. They're actually belonging to a created subgroup. So here what I've done is I've added or I've opened a match page for one of the matches. Let's say this is match number five between Frank Bettinger and John Weston. And I'm going th working through that full list, subgrouping. I get to match number five. I open it. And when I look at the shared matches with that match number five, I find that everyone in that group, or most everyone, is already in an existing subgroup, the orange subgroup. So I'm not going to create a whole new subgroup with this many matches already in it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add match number five to this existing orange subgroup. Okay, And I'll also add match number two to that existing orange subgroup. Now, it's a question of when do you create a new group, when do you add to an existing group, and that's, that's a tough question. There's no right or wrong answer there. That's probably something that hopefully you'll figure out down the road as you work with these subgroups more and more. Okay, So the match lists are likely to get smaller and smaller. As you work further down the list and you're adding people to new groups, you're going to find that... Um, the match lists, the shared match groups are going to get smaller and smaller. And then you'll get to the point where you're adding most of the matches in that list to existing groups. Now, I don't create subgroups with only one or two people. I'll typically just leave those empty. Uh, I'm, I, you can decide whether you want to do that or not. I find that usually there's not enough trees in that group for to be able to work with. So um, I find that to be not very useful. The other thing is, is once you create all these subgroups, they're, again, acting as nets. They will catch new matches as they come in. So you can add people to existing subgroups as, they, as these new matches come in, which means you'll have to go through this process periodically to add these new matches to the proper subgroup or subgroups. So here's an example of Frank Bettinger's match list. So all I've done is I've gone back to Frank Bettinger's list of DNA matches, and not surprisingly, some of his matches are in a shared uh, in these subclusters, and some of them are not, and that's simply to be expected. Now, if I were to go and click shared matches with John Weston, that original yellow group, of course, now I see almost everyone in that yellow dot group, all 150 matches, are in a subcluster, one or two subcluster. Now there are a few stragglers just because they didn't fit any groups and they were only a couple people, so I didn't create new groups for them. But most of the shared matches between Frank Bettinger and John Weston are formed in these subclusters. And because these subclusters here are um, these sh shared matches between Frank Bettinger and John Weston are sorted by size, it's to be expected that there's no real order to these subclusters. So you can see they're, they're kind of jumbled up, but that's the value of creating these subclusters. We are adding organization to the, essentially, the unorganized. Okay? So when I did this process, what I found was there was about 150 matches shared between Frank Bettinger and John Weston, and these formed 11 
total subgroups. So 150 people formed 11 total subgroups. And the sizes of each of those subgroups you can see here are in parentheses. So um, if I look at this, I have a seven unknown subgroups, meaning I have not yet identified the common ancestor of those particular subgroups. I also have seven, uh, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four known groups, meaning I know or I hypothesize the common ancestry of the people in those subgroups. So you may be doing this with a, where you have no idea what the people are, or maybe you'll do this and you'll know where all of the groups are. But either way, you can form these nice discrete subgroups, and it's a way of organizing your matches. So here gives you an idea of where these particular groups come from. The Bettinger group is from ancestor couple number one, the Washburn from ancestor couple number two, then the group, the Johnson and Snell groups are from ancestor couple number four. All right, so you can see to date, I have not yet identified any subclusters from three because that's my unknown line. And of course, that process is going to be a lot more complicated. And that essentially is the question, right? What do we do now? Why did we go to all this work of subclustering? Well, first, it forms nice organization. You form these nice Bettinger groups, the Washburn groups. Of course, they'll be different for your family. But whatever group it is, you have now these, these focused family groups. But what I want to do is I want to essentially find the common ancestry for each of the subclusters. And I'm particularly interested in the subclusters that don't have any known common ancestry identified yet. So I want to take all of these unknowns, those seven subgroups, and take them to known groups. I want to give a common ancestor or ancestors to each of these individual subgroups. So the steps of the subgroup review process are also fairly straightforward, and it's essentially what we do for shared matches anyway. And we are going to navigate to one of the subgroups. We're going to open the trees in the subgroup, and then we're simply going to review the trees to identify a pattern. We're looking for a common surname, a common location, or whatever uh, pattern, common ancestry we can potentially identify. Now, this, we aren't reaching conclusions here, of course. We are simply formulating hypotheses about how these um, subgroups uh, are related to us and John Weston, Frank Bettinger and John Weston. So, for example, here, we're going to navigate to a subgroup. So what I'll do is I will go to, in common with John Weston, subgroup number three in my filter list at the top of, my, of the Frank Bettinger match page. And then I'm going to click on it, and I'll get a list of all 34 matches in this subgroup. And then the next step is I'm going to open all of the trees. Now, this is a partial of the list. There are 34 people, um, not a plethora of trees, unfortunately, but I can open some of these trees. There are more that are not shown here. And what I hope to do, is, again, is to review them to find a pattern. Is there a surname that shows up over and over again? Is there a family that shows up over and over again? Are they all from, say, Saratoga, New York, for example? Are they all a common ancestry in any way? Sometimes this is going to work, and sometimes it's not. Often I find it won't work because there just isn't enough trees, there's not enough people in the subgroup, and so some of this is simply a waiting game, working through this process multiple times over months to find enough people in a subgroup. So in the meantime, what you want to be doing is you want to build out trees for people in this subgroup, you want to uh, build new trees. So if we look back, for example, we can see person number three has four people in the tree. That's probably enough people to build out a full tree for that individual. And so that's what we'll do. We'll build out that tree for that person and try to find potentially a link to our ancestry. Now, if you identify a source or possible source of a subcluster, you can change the name of that subgroup at Ancestry. So, for example, I can go from in common with John Weston subgroup number three to in common with John Weston Smith subgroup. What does that mean? It means I found shared Smith ancestry in the member in some members of subgroup number three, and so I have a hypothesis that that's our relationship. That's only, of course, if I'm successful in identifying a potential hypothesis. Many times, I'm just not able to do that. So I want to emphasize this isn't magic. It's simply a way to focus your research on discrete subclusters rather than looking at a list of 150 shared matches and trying to wonder what to do next. You're likely not going to find the source of all of your subgroups. In fact, you may do this and not find any of those sources. But at least what you're doing now is you're working on smaller discrete groups that are more likely to have common ancestry than everyone in a shared match list, 150 people, that are going to have not have common shared ancestry um, instead um, 
uh, are going to have ancestry through different lines. Repeat this process occasionally to add new matches. So wait a week, go through this process again, and you're going to find is when you click on, say, um, shared matches with John Weston, you're going to have new people that are not added to that group yet because they're new in the past couple of weeks. So you add them to that group, click on that person and see if they fit into one of the existing subgroups. Most of the time, it's going to be very clear. You'll click on shared matches with that new match and everyone in that group will have the green dot or everyone in that group will have the purple dot and so you know where to add that new person. You know what subgroup they belong to. All right. And with that, I want to wish you good luck, and hopefully this sub-clustering process gives you some success with your genealogical research. Thank you.